Good evening. It's Friday, June 3rd. Welcome to Ephesians Visions Ministry. I'm Dr. Tom Watson, and tonight we're going to talk about prophecy and end times. And it's nice to see all you people here, and those of you that are watching at home, you're probably still here too, that uh, May 21st, 2011, none of us dematerialized. None of us were raptured up. So I thought, in keeping with that, we're going to talk about something that's been going around on the Internet and on the news that uh, deals with December 21st, 2012. Now, what does that mean? What is it? And hopefully I can give you some clarity to that tonight and some teachings and some of the other, you can call them conspiracies, you can call them what you will, but many other cultures and religions talk about 2012 as being the end of days. Well, I will give you some scriptures at the end that says, this world is not going to end. This is not going to be the end of the world. The earth is not going to disappear and be a, be a speck of cosmic dust. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, but that's going to be right here. It's going to be right here. It's going to be in Jerusalem. And I'll give you the scriptures for that later, so stick around. So, why is 2012 related to the end, of the end and not the beginning of the world? Because 2012 is the year that was picked out by a variety of cultures, as I said. And it's particularly the Mayan culture, but several others. But it's also an end of an age. If that's when it happens, the return of Christ, the end of the age of grace and the beginning of the age of the kingdom, when we're going to rule and reign for a thousand years. There's going to be a time period in there. So there are several lines of thought that point to the year 2012 as a period of radical transformation and the culmination of human history. Is it going to end then? So December 21st, in Mayan prophecy, they mistakenly have said that's the end of the world. They evidently didn't say that, but the news media has misinterpreted that. First of all, what it is, is during the Mayan 13 Bakken countdown, it's a termination point, December 21st, 2012, which is the winter solstice. A lot of things are going to happen on that date, according to this. It's the end, uh, the Bakken calendar, B-A-K-T-U-N calendar, began in August 12th, 3114 B.C. So, one-fifth of the procession deals with the B-A-T-K-U-N calendar. It's a 26,000-year period. And they discovered that in 2012 was an end date which coincided exactly with the galactic alignment, where the sun is going to be in direct alignment through a space directly to the middle of the Milky Way. And all the planets in the, our solar system will be in one perfect line. Everything will be lined up. This happens once every 26,000 years. So it is actually a solar event that's going to happen then. Nobody knows what that will do, what that will cause. But the Mayans taught that this was the birth of the sun. This was the birth canal that the sun came out, and we do know that the Milky Way gives birth to stars. That's, that's an astronomical uh, fact. And so they, they, this started way back with the Olmec civilization who first began charting this in 680 BC. And then the infer was given information to the Mayans and they tracked the winter solstice. Mostly it was for planting crops and it helped create 17 of their calendars. And, it, and during the course of looking at the sun, who they thought was a god, and we'll talk about this more in a minute, that they found the earth actually wobbled on its axis. Scientists now tell us the earth wobbles on its axis, but they found this out several thousands of years ago. So the progression, uh, precession is what they call it, there's a gradual shift and drift of the stars across the heavens every year. That's due to the earth's wobble. So the earth wobbles. So as I said, it's a, every one-fifth is a 5,100 and 25 year cycle. So the 26,000 years are coming up and we're realigning the galactic center. And this is supposed to be a wake up call. So that as I said, once every cycle, the dark point at the center of the Milky Way called the galactic equator, whom they called the sacred tree, intersects with the elliptical or the plane of the sun 
who they thought was a god moving across the sky. So this is going to happen on that day. Okay, so it is an actual astronomical event, December 21st, 2012, once every 26,000 years. And we're all going to be around to see it unless, unless something happens before that that none of us are here. So, the Mayan mythology, the sun is the god, the Milky Way, the gateway was the life and death. So this was a birth canal. So the hieroglyphics indicate the next interception then would be December 2012. The Mayans weren't prophets. They were great mathematicians and accomplished astronomers. They were not doomsday predictors. They were not that at all. They discovered, they actually discovered and studied the sunspots and they found cycles to the sunspots that our astronomers today still don't understand and they're just trying to decipher the Dresden codes and the Mayan prophecies that there were are written down, how the sunspots work, and how they affect our growth and our weather, because they do affect our weather to an extent. Global warming is not due to us with our pollution. I'm sure it's helped a little bit, maybe 2% is what the, the knowledgeable scientists tell us. But the sunspots and the amount of heat given off the sun by the sun affects our climate here, and the amount of radiation that it gets through. So the Mayans weren't doomsday predictors. They were mathematicians and they were astronomers, but they also practiced astrology, which we as Christians don't believe in. We can look at the stars and see, well, this is, this is, this is uh, Jupiter and Mercury and Mars, and this is Perseus and things like that. We can all say that because even the Bible mentions that in Deuteronomy. So the Bible mentions the astrological signs up there, but we don't believe in the astrology that... Gee, today my ast ast astrological forecast is I'm going to come into wealth or I'm going to trip and fall. I mean, you can read that in the paper. I don't read that stuff, but it's there for us, those that believe that. So the Mayans, however, were very brutal. They actually sacrificed humans. They shed a lot of blood. They thought pulling somebody's heart out was cool while it was still beating and they would hold it because this was the seed of life. They were false worshipers. In Romans 125, it says, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped the served created things rather than the Creator. So they worshipped the created things. They didn't worship the Creator. They thought it was great to worship a beating heart out here that they would rip out of somebody's chest. And the bloodstains in the Mayan uh, pyramids are still there. The bloodstains uh, uh, I have seen over in, in Greece, too, where they did animal sacrifice. And the animal sacrifice they did over there was for temporary cleansing of sins, not for a permanent cleansing of sins as Christ did in your lives, but for temporary. But the blood has stained. That's where I've seen blood is over there in the in the Greek um, sacrificial areas where they sacrificed animals and humans frequently. So the blood does stain the ground permanently. So there's no biblical evidence of a December 21st, 2012 as an end of the world. As I said, the world is not going to end. And I'll tell you and show you how by the Bible. The Mormons now are a different subject. The Mormons had, in their history before they came over here, there were three groups of people mentioned in the Mormon books. And the Jaredites were the first group. They lived from 2200 B.C. to 600 B.C. They were somehow killed off in a massive battle. And, and that killed, the last Jaredite was killed then. After this happened, two more groups moved into this land over in the Middle East, according to the Mormon books now. And the groups were called the Nephites and the Lamanites. And the Nephi was a group that believed in the Law of Moses. And the Lamanites didn't believe in the Law of Moses. So what does that mean? They just didn't believe in Moses and his laws. And the Nephites eventually destroyed all the Lam Lamanites. Now Moroni, the angel Moroni that sits on top of the Mormon temples, if you've seen the Mormon temples, is the last Nephite who appeared in spirit to Joseph Smith. Now the Mormon population we know is in this, the state of Utah, the majority of that. There is some belief that there's an underground city being built there by the Mormons that could sustain 10% of the population of the world in some of the teachings. This is all on the internet. I cross-referenced and checked several places. So this is one of the either conspiracy things or real things. We know for a fact 
that the Mormons have been storing up food. We also know for the fact that the government has been buying up excess food and storing it too. Our federal government. Why? Do they know something we don't know? Are they expecting World War III? Well, we'll talk about World War III tonight too. But so they may know something that the rest of the world doesn't know that's going to happen soon. So the Mormon Armageddon was first predicted by the Mormons to be in 1891 or earlier. They predicted the Armageddon to occur then. And Joseph Smith, in February of 1835, he called his people together to tell them he had spoken to God. And during their conversation, learned that Jesus would return within the next 56 years, after which the end times would begin promptly. So, I mean, 56 years before 1891 is what... Uh, uh, 36 or something, 1836. The Mormons have been around there for about 40 years and 45 years, I believe. But this is <clears throat> one of the false prognosticators saying the earth is going to end. He talked to God. Jesus is coming back. And Armageddon is going to occur as early as uh, 1835. So again, I told you about the 10% the, uh, population of the world that they can support under the ground. There's a lot of caves in Utah. I don't know if this is true or not, but this is one of those on the Internet. So who else talks about this? What else talks about 2012s? Interestingly enough, the Bible codes do. The Bible codes talk to some extent, and you're all familiar with the Bible codes, so you read the... Uh, the fifth word and the third line repetitively, and it gives you a whole information. So there's been a lot of study into that. Now, Revelation 16, verse 8 through 9 says, And they, they forth poured out his bowl, the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and was given to it to burn men with fire. And the men were burned with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of the God, who has the authority over those plagues, and they did not repent to give him glory. These are men on earth who didn't repent. They were burned. They were burned up. So the Bible code talks about a solar flare, and it gives the year 2012, a massive solar flare. We know from the solar scientists that every 100 years or so, the sun flares up and fries the solar system. It's about to do it again in 2012. They predicted that. They're not saying it's the end of the earth. They're not saying Christ is returning. They're saying there's going to be gigantic solar flares next year that can wipe out our entire uh, satellite system. Guess what? No internet, no cell phones, no TV, no cable TV. It's going to be, and some of the radio stations will be wiped out too. So the Bible codes tell that a cluster after cluster, and the clusters are how they read in the Bible codes, describing a nasty solar event that can happen in 2012. And this is an article published in New Scientist magazine that it may cause destruction of the earth. This is a scientific magazine predicting that for 2012. Isaiah 30, 26 to 27. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. That means it gets pretty bright. And the light of the sun shall be sevenfold. That means it's a lot brighter than it is now, which means it's sending out a flare, which means it's giving a great corona of light, greater than we see it now, as the light of seven days. In the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people, and healeth the stroke of their wound. Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire. What does a solar flare look like? It looks like a tongue coming out. What else looks like a tongue in the sky that you've all maybe seen at one time or another? A comet. The tongue of fire is an important clue. There's a large stone-like comet due to approach the earth in 2012 to come within very close proximity to the earth. Okay? So I'm just telling you things that are happening in 2012 that are predicted. So this comet is like a tongue. The destructive characteristic of the event is described as a tongue-like. The folks of Exodus... 2006, which is another group that are talking about the end times, theorized the comet breaks up like the Shoemaker-Levy comet did when it came to Jupiter. Remember those pictures of the comet hitting Jupiter as it broke up? And it was quite looked like tongues sticking up. 
and thus creating a tongue-like array of comet matter which impacts the Earth in a shotgun effect. These are scientists talking about this. The approach of the Lark Comet in 2012 will trigger a solar eruption that will fry the Earth like a rotisserie, they say. The solar flare and resulting coronal mass ejection, called a CME, will be tongue-like characteristic of this event. How many know that last Monday a comet hit the sun? Some of you know that. You saw that. And it sent out a tongue. It didn't go out very far. It didn't go out as far as Mercury. But this was a small comet. We're talking about a huge comet that they're talking about coming. Wow. So we got the Bible codes. We've got the Mormons. Now the Tibetan monks even have to get into the action. So the Tibetan monks have some great powers according to them. I'm not saying they do, but they tell it. They have remote viewing. They can see things remotely. And they're saving the world from destroying itself in 2012. They believe some event's going to happen. And it's nothing new in Tibetan monasteries. For thousands of years, remote viewing in the middle of another spiritual activities have dominated the Tibetan culture. When India, tourists from India came to learn from the few Tibetan monasteries, they found some amazing and fascinating things that this, this remote viewing, they could see things that no other people could see. And some of them actually existed. According to the tourists, they were seeing world powers in the course of self-destruction five years ago. Are we looking at that today? We are. They see the world will not be destroyed between now and 2012. The superpowers will continue to engage in regional wars. Terrorism and covert, covert war will be the main problem. How many covert wars are we looking at now? We're looking at Yemen. They've advised all British people today to, to evacuate Yemen because half of it's under Al-Qaeda control right now. So there's major fighting going on over there. Between 2010 and 2012, the whole world will get polarized and prepare for an ultimate doomsday, according to Tibetan uh, remote viewers. Heavy political movers and negotiations will take place with little progress. How much negotiations have been going on in different places and nothing's happened? All over the world. In 2012, the Tibetan monks says the world will start plunging into total destructive nuclear war. At that time, something remarkable will happen, they say. They don't say what it is, though. And the Buddhist monk of Tibet, say the Buddhist monks of Tibet, supernatural divine powers will intervene, and the destiny of the world is not to self-destruct at that time. Not to self-destruct is what the Tibetan monks are saying. Interesting. So we talked about remote viewing in the 2012 and all, all this stuff already, but it will not self-destruct. How many of you have heard of the I Ching? Some of you have heard of I Ching. The, Bill? You've heard of it. The I Ching is known in the West as the Book of Change. And it's the oldest known book in the world, originating thousands of years ago and among, among the shaman diviners of ancient China. There are 64 images in the I Ching, which when you, they're associated with numbers, and the numbers are derived from technical manipulation that enable a skilled psychic reader to, to look at them and, and determine what they're saying. So when they're in a specific order, it tells them this is the best time to plant. This is the best time to buy crops. This is the best time to sell your land. This is the best time to buy land. So it was used originally for economic purposes and agricultural purposes. It's been around thousands of years and it's been abused as fortune telling too. The name may be translated as the Book of Change. I, I means not only change, but other things. It also means permanence or the unchangeable. The Book of Changes views all the changes that we and the world would go through in an unfolding of the immutable laws and principles of existence. The I Ching views the universe as a natural and well-coordinated system which the process of change never ceases. Never ceases. But it's its images. And it views the universe, as I said, it presents human nature and destiny is based on principle and order, used for buying stocks. Accidentally, accidentally it predicted the end of the world as we know it, December of 2012. Jack Van Empe's presented this, 
Hal Lindsey's presented some of this. So I'm not the first one saying this, but it's very interesting that it says this. So we've got the I Ching, we've got the monks, we've got the Mormons, we've got the uh, the Mayan, the Mayans, and the Incans. If we want to go there. So what's going to happen in 2012? Now we got other scientists saying there will be a major polar shift or a polar reversal to take place in the Earth. The North Pole will be changed into the South Pole. Does anybody have any idea what that means? What can happen with that? The North Pole the South Pole? Yes, and the South Pole will become the North Pole. It changes weather. Well, it'll change more than weather. It'll change the crust of the Earth. The whole crust will change. The Earth isn't going to turn over. The poles will change places. It'll, it'll cause catastrophic earthquakes, hurricanes, weather changes. If, if the scientists are correct in what they're saying. The sun, this can only be explained by the fact the Earth will start rotating in the opposite direction together with a huge disaster of unknown proportions. As a result, our magnetic fields will reverse it all at once with catastrophic consequences. Now, I don't hear this as doom and gloom. I'm telling you these are conspiracy things on the internet. Yes, we'll see earthquakes in diverse places. Yes, we'll see storms. Yes, we'll see changes in the heaven and the earth. We don't know what that all means. The Bible's not 100% clear on this. What does the Bible tell you? Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Look up because your redemption draws nigh. You will not enter the hour of tribulation. This is going to be tribulation if it occurs. I'm not saying it will. But the Bible says do not be afraid. If Jesus is in control of your life, He'll give you a peace that passes all understanding and a joy unspeakable. Mm -hmm. He will watch over you and protect you. Yes. you turn in Thursday nights and watch Bill Hewitt and Bev Hewitt teach on the book of John and how much Christ loves you, how much he cares about you. He's not going to let this happen to you. But it's the unbelievers out there and the ones that scoff at God because there are scoffers and will turn their back on God. Is this stuff in store for them? I don't know. I'm just telling you what's out there. Massive earthquakes would demolish all buildings on the planet, instigate colossal tsunamis, intense volcanic activities. The earth crust will shift, sweeping continents thousands of miles from their present positions. The Dresden Codex also talks about this in the Mayan culture. It talks about a comet hitting the earth, changing the poles and reversing everything. So it also talks about it in their past of this happening. Has it happened yet? Well, we know back in Russia, back in about, what, 1912, where a comet came down and wiped out thousands of square miles. Not very many people lived there, so there weren't deaths attributed to that except for some animals. But it snuck up on us. Now we have the Hopi Indians. How many have heard the Hopi Indian prophecies before? Some of you have. So I'm not going to go on a great deal to this, but the Hopi Indians, uh, at a talk given by Lee Brown in, a, in Fairbanks, Alaska, about 15 years ago or so, the stone tablets, they talk about a stone tablets are given to different races of the world, and the ra yellow race of people are kept by the Tibets, Tibet. So what they're saying, the Hopi Indians got some of this. There's also some other color tablets. Uh, a white race of people got the guardianship t of the fire tablet. Uh, to the south, the yellow race of guardianship of the wind. So there's a variety of things. It gets very, to me, it was a little difficult to understand all this. So the stones of the tablets of the yellow race are kept by the Tibetans. If you went straight through the Hopi Indian Reservation in New Mexico, to the other side of the world, you come out in Tibet. The Tibetan word for sun is Hopi, is the Hopi word for moon, and the Hopi word for sun is the Tibetan word for moon. Did that happen by accident? I don't know. They're in exact opposite places in the world. If we drew the hole through, remember when kids, if, you, if we dug deep enough, we'd come out in China. Yeah. Well, if you dug through the Hopi Indian Reservation, the Arizona, New Mexico area, you will come out in Tibet. They're at the same longitude and latitude if you go around the world. So anyway, there's a lot of similarities, but they predicted that that in their prophecies there will be a religion that comes here to the Hopis. 
Is that the Christian religion? Probably, because it came there. Maybe it will be true and bring unity, or maybe it will be not true and not bring unity. This is a direct quote from them. If it does not bring unity, a second religion will come, and the people of the region are known in the Hopi languages as the Bahani. The people of Bahani means people of, which was heard, this, this guy said uh, he heard about these prophecies. None of them made any sense. It didn't to me either. Most of it has come to pass. But he put up, the house in the sky will be put up in 1996, and it could be sooner. It's been postponed for four years at least three times now, which brings us to 2012. But it's not too long it's going to go up. The earth as we know it is going to change. So they're predicting there's going to be changes in 2012 too. But you can see it's a very convoluted type of prophecy. And reading it all, it gets a little confusing. Now who else talked to us about prophecies in 2012? Various prophecies of Notre, Notre, Nostradamus, and he wrote in quatrains. If you've ever seen his quatrains, they're a little nebulous too. They're hard to understand. But he got a lot of his information right out of the Bible. Because these were in, this was, I think, the 1500s he wrote his quatrains. Some of them are pretty clear and some of them are nebulous. He called Hitler and where he would come from Hitler. And he described where Hitler was going to be born. He described World War I, II, and Three, occurring approximately World War I and II when they did, and World War III coming up in his quatrains. They're, they're a little nebulous to decipher, but it, looked, it was 2012. And there would be increase in large-scale calamities all over the world, famines, etc. But as I said, he got most of his information from the Bible, but he would go into trances and see all this transpiring. Again, predicting the end of the world. How many know about the Great Pyramid of Giza? They have, they have a time... They have a time uh, line in the stairwell that ends in 2012. Why is that? Did they get tired of writing and walking up the stairs? The stairs keep going up farther. You know, it's very interesting. And it, according to the, what I have read on the internet and seen in two books, that they actually, the timeline predicted World War I and World War II within two years. And the, when was the Great Pyramid of Giza built? 3,000 years ago or something? Of, of Kofu? Uh, and it was also built as an observation deck for the Great Conduct Junction of December 21st, 2012. This is something I did not know when I researched this. But as an observation deck for December 21st, 2012, what does that mean? They, would, they just say it means what it says. Here's the Illuminati. We were talking about them earlier. They're listed also with the groups that are looking at 2012 as the end, which is from Freemasonry. It's an inner circle of members, a secret group called the Illuminati or the Enlightened Ones. Some say this is all conspiracy and doesn't exist. Others say the group actually does exist. So we'll talk about this in another teaching and, and give you some historical background of this. It was founded by Adam Weiss, Weishaupt, who was heavily involved in the occult, That'll give you a clue, oh, yeah. you know. And the order was founded on May 1st, 1776. So May 1st is the grand climax, and it's an important day for Satanists. And their apocalypse, they describe, which is described on the Internet as a hoax, I put that in their parentheses, was described as being in 2012. So another group. But again, it's occult. Astrology, which is occult. We don't believe in the Tibetan monks' uh, ability to see what they see through their um, their visions that they have, as I talked about here earlier, the uh, remote viewing. That's like automatic writing. If you saw Indiana Jones and the, 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 the crystal skull, mm -hmm. you know. So we don't believe in that as Christians. But other places talk about this. Even Albert Einstein got into the act. Okay? And he talked about if the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe, then man would only have four years of life left. Did the bee start disappearing about three years ago? Albert Einstein said this back in the 30s. No more bees, no more pollination, no more plants, no more animals, no more man. This is a direct quote from Albert Einstein. 
So he talked about vanishing bee colonies. He also talked about doomsday, doomsday scenarios and how the sunspots would bring it into the earth. Related to the solar flares? I don't know. But this is some of the things he talked about. And then, of course, as we all know, on May 21st, 2011, at 6 p.m. in each time zone, but you've got to realize that, uh, that 6 p.m. in one part of the world is 6 p.m. 24 hours later in another part of the world or 24 hours earlier, wherever you are. But he said it was going to happen 21st, May 21st, 2011. He also predicted in 1996 it would be in. But now he said it was wrong, and so everybody be ready because he's predicted October 21st, 2011. Okay? What I'm saying is I don't know if that's the right date or not. I can give find no information that it is. That's a rapture date? No, that's what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> is that a rapture or is that the return of Christ? Or is that the doomsday when actually Armageddon occurs, which they're saying Armageddon will occur that day and the earth will end? That's what some of the teachers are talking about, that it will just end. So who knows? But guess who else? I'm just giving you out of maybe 100 possible predictions dating back to Babylonia and all through the Roman Empire and pre-Roman, the Medo-Persian era, there were people that predicted Armageddon was going to occur very soon. The people back during the Roman Empire believed Armageddon was going to happen back then. They were so convinced that it was, and they were so convinced Christ would return after 70 AD when the Jews were wiped out in Jerusalem. In, 19, in 1843, the Millerites <clears throat> in New England, who was a pastor, predicted the earth would end in 1943, as we know it, or in 1843. R.W. Armstrong predicted the world would end in the 1890s. I think he was with the Seventh-day Adventist. It's worldwide. Worldwide. Okay, yeah. Haley's Comet was predicted to destroy the earth in 1910. Mm -hmm. Pat Robertson in 1982 said... That's when it was going to end. We know what Hal Lindsey did in the late great planet Earth. And even Hal Lindsey's program tonight dealt a little bit with this. Uh, and even uh, Jack Van Empey on Wednesday night, if any of you watched that, addressed some of this during the first 10 minutes. I didn't get any information from either of those other than it confirmed what I had. And Heaven's Gate, we, George Ann and I lived in San Diego then. And all these guys thought that when the comet... comet Chihotany came through, they all drank the Kool-Aid, and they died in this mansion. It took a long time to sell that mansion after they died in there. And we were there. It made big headlines back there. Nostradamus predicted August of 1999. And, of course, remember, everybody remembers the Y2K thing in January 1st. Out. The, the, earth was gonna, the world was going to end then. The, all the computers would crash, and we'd all die. And how many guys since then have predicted Jeremiah 14, 14. Then Jehovah said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake I unto them. They prophesy unto you a lying vision and divination, a thing not in the seat of their own heart. So more than 16 men in the last 100 years have predicted the end of the earth. But of that day and hour, Matthew twenty four thirty six, no one, not even the angels of heaven, neither the Son nor the Father knows. This is not the rapture. In no place in the four Gospels is there any correlation to the rapture. What this means here, it deals with the actual return of Christ. When he puts his feet on the mount over Armageddon and returns and says, enough. And the great earthquake occurs there, which there, as I said, there's a major... There's a major uh, earthquake uh, fault line that runs through this area. It's all, it's all been diagrammed out by the uh, volcanologists and stuff. But again, this verse, Matthew 24, 36, deals with the return of Christ. It doesn't deal with the rapture. So when no man knows the hour or the day, not even the angels of heaven, neither the Son, but only the Father, it deals with the return of Christ. Christ doesn't, didn't know when he was going to return. He tells us he'll return. So, 
Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, Luke 21, 10. And this is what the Bible says about what's coming. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places, fearful events. I like the word fearful events. How do you describe the nuclear holocaust going on in Japan right now? The Bible doesn't address it except in this. It doesn't address it in Mark 13 or Matthew 24. It doesn't say fearful events. Okay, and great signs from heaven. So we know there have been great earthquakes. There was a 6.2 earthquake in northern South America yesterday. There was a 5.4 earthquake in Honshu, Japan again today, and a 6.2 yesterday afternoon. You know, I mean, so are these great earthquakes? No. The great earthquakes are greater than 8.0. Oh, yeah. But in the 1950s, there was one earthquake, 6.0. All the rest of them were 3.0 and 4.0. This year alone, how many, we could all guess there's been at least 26.0 or greater earthquakes this year alone. Excuse me. Famines. We know there's famines in, in Africa now, other places of the world. We know that the floods in North America right now in Arkansas and in Louisiana are going to wipe out crops, wheat fields. Right now, I don't know how many of you know this, but in North Dakota, there's major flooding going on along the Missouri River. That's flooding out wheat land there. It's going into South Dakota. It will go through Iowa. It'll go down to Kansas. This is the Missouri River that's flooding now, and it's the worst they've ever seen it. It was, in the, it was again, in the headlines today of that happening. So what else does God say? In Luke 21, 25, there'll be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. We talked about solar flares. We talked about comets. On the earth, earth nations will be in anguish and perpetually at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Verse 26 says, people will pay, not 26 people, I'm sorry it looks that way, it's verse, Luke 21 verse 26. People will faint from terror apprehensive of what is coming to the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Shaken. Which means the stars will shake, the sun will shake, all the heavenly bodies will shake. Luke 21, 29, he told them this parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees. Again, a sign of the end times. When they sprout leaves, you will see for yourself and know that summer is near. We know summer is near. We know Christ is coming back soon because of everything that's happening. Even so, when you see these things, you know the kingdom of God is near. God says, do not fear. Do not fear. He'll protect us. Verse, verse 32 says, Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things will happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. What does that mean, that this generation? I'll tell you. According to the biblical mathematicians, a generation is 52 years. According to the fact the Bible gives the scriptures that Israel has to be reborn. It was disseminated, the great diaspora. You'll see that in Isaiah and I think Jeremiah. But now Egypt, all 12 tribes of Egypt have returned. And of course we know there are sub-tribes in these 12 tribes. But all 12 tribes, the last tribe, the 12th tribe of Manasseh returned two years ago from Indonesia. We know that Israel became a true nation reborn when it got its original borders back in 1967. So, and please don't hear me, I'm not predicting the day or the hour. I'm telling you what the Bible says. I'm telling you what a generation, according to the biblical scholars are, according to Israel being reborn, according to the scriptures. So if we had 1967 plus 52 years is 2019, minus seven years for Daniel's 70th week, or the seven-year tribulation points to 2012 again. I'm giving you math. I'm not doing the math like Harold Camping did. It's going to be 6 p.m. on May 21st because it's exactly 3,200 years from Noah's thing. I'm just saying this is a three, simple three-step thing. I don't have a day. I don't have an hour. But I know it's the season. I know summer is close because the scripture told us that here, that Look at the fig tree in verse 29, all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourself. Who is the fig tree? Israel. Yes. Israel is the fig tree. They've sprouted leaves. They know summer is near. You know the kingdom of God is near, and that's the generation. So the world will not end. Only the age of grace ends, and the kingdom age begins, the kingdom of God. 
as it returns. There are over 120 verses. You probably heard Jack Van Empey say that on Wednesday night that deal with the world's not going to end. Psalm 104.5, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should never be moved forever. Forever, the Bible says. Psalm 37.29, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Matthew 5.5, 5, the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. When you're going to inherit something, that means you're going to have it for the rest of your life. Is Isaiah 45.17, but Israel shall be saved by Jehovah, our God, with an everlasting salvation, you shall not be put to shame nor confounded. World without end. Word without men end means world without end. Revelation 22.5. So I go Old Testament to New Testament. There shall be no light there. And there will be no need candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them life. And they shall reign forever and ever. This is at the end of the Bible. What do we believe? We believe what the word of God says. Daniel 7.14 And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting, everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. We know the kingdom is coming. What is that kingdom? Isaiah 65.17 says See I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered nor they will come to mind. As the new heavens and the earth I will make endure before me, declares the Lord, so you, will your name and descendants endure. Endure means they'll last a long time. So he's making a heaven and earth. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. How about that? Said that in Isaiah. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. From God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I looked in a loud voice from the throne, saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. The Lord then told John in Revelation 22, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll, because the time is near. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to you each person according to what they have done. I'm coming soon. This is the end of the Bible. This is the end of the Bible. He's coming soon. He's bringing a, a heaven and earth to come here to dwell with us and live with us. We're not to be afraid because we're going to rule and reign forever and ever with him. Ever and ever. So praise be to God. Hallelujah. This is what the Bible says about the coming end. A lot of interesting stuff out there. A lot of conspiracies, a lot of prophecies. But we know only the true word of God is the true prophecy. George Ann. Was that a lot of information you don't see anywhere else? Wow. He said to me driving over on the car today, my presentation tonight is something I would be interested in watching. <laughs> if someone was presenting it. <laughs> Being the scientist that he is, that's where his interests are. Oh, by the way, it's Tom's birthday today. And if 2012 is in fact, this may be the last year you have to celebrate. You won't be getting a lot, whole lot older. <laughs> I'll be young forever. <laughs> this, right here? I've gone too far this time, huh? Okay, I'm just going to move the cord so I don't fall in. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's good to see everybody tonight. Hope you had a nice Memorial Day weekend. We had a wonderful time. We got to see two of our grandsons that are seven and nine and spend time with them. It was fun. But the weather, everyone wants to know what is going on with our wacky, weird weather in this country. It's the whole world, but in this country especially. Since 2011 started, we've seen massive snowstorms and, and severe cold weather. That was not only in this country, it's been all over the world. Epic fires in Texas, floods from the Mississippi and, and other rivers, as Tom said, the Missouri, severe flooding tornadoes that are more deadly than anything we've seen since 1950. And hurricane season is just ready to start to be upon us. Who knows what that's going to be like? 
Everyone wants to know what's going on with the weather. Could it be any coincidence with all that we've endured in the last 10 days, or maybe closer to two weeks, I think it was on a Thursday or Friday, President Obama threw Israel under the bus. Are there any coincidences with what's happening in the weather? Is God's hand starting to be removed from us? I mean, it's something we have to really look at. I mean, a lot of people would laugh at us saying something like that. But look at the tragedy since that day. It started immediately after that. The very next day. The climatologists are stating that the earth is getting colder. And that's what's causing the severity of our weather because of the coldness. It's causing these violent weather changes. I was watching someone give a report on that today. And he said, with everyone saying that, you know, that's the warming and everything, it's the exact opposite. The cold is what's causing it. And it's going to become more violent because our weather is going to continue to get colder. We're going to see year after year that it's going to be more severe. And a thing about that is that he said we're also going to see more droughts. We're going to see more heat waves coming up because of this weather change. And he said having the cold weather is much worse than having the warm weather that we were experiencing for many years because it's harder on our bodies as humans. It's harder to survive under those circumstances in every way, you know, for whether it's the growth in the, you know, in the earth or whatever with the freezing weather, it's a lot more difficult. So that's been a lot to look at. Our weather alone has been massive. I mean, that's been one of the high things, you know, across the, the world. But the economy is another issue and another point that everyone is interested in. You know, the investors in our country are starting to become very concerned with what they're seeing. The debt crisis, we were told just this week that if we don't increase the debt limit, then our rating's going to be dropped. They're threatening that. Now, whether that's going to happen or not, we will have to see. But I've heard congressmen speaking this week saying it has to stop. It has to stop somewhere. And we all agree with that in this room, I'm sure, that the debt has to cease. Yeah. The UN warns that if the US dollar collapses, that it'll upset the entire global economy. And the, the rest of the world's already in its own crisis situation. Our job market is down. Jobs in May were fewer than they've been for hiring workers since I think two years. Didn't they say in 2008? Unemployment's going higher and higher. It's gonna go back up to double digits. It's close right now instead of it decreasing and, and getting better, as we're being told. Home sales declining. They're stagnant all over the country. But we're seeing a surge in gas and food prices. And the Japanese effect on manufacturing has caused our manufacturing to cool. So many of the things we need that are manufactured over there because of their crisis, we're unable to get. So we're closing plants, laying people off. But there's good hope. Obama today <laughs> signed an agreement, I believe it was just today, between Fiat and Chrysler. Now we're supposedly no longer going to hold stakes as a government in these two com companies. That was supposed to have been the big hope for our economy crisis for today. Yes, today there was agree an agreement signed between Fiat uh, Car Corporation, I don't know what their full title is from Italy, and Chrysler. And they're no longer going to have their stock held by the government. The government had been holding that when they were handing out all the bailouts and things. So that was supposed to have been our hope for the crisis. I mean, that was supposed to have been a big thing today, that that's going to make such a difference. I don't see how it's going to in the economy. It's it's seeing one step go closer in the right direction, but how much will it really change things? And on a little lighter side, I saw that TV executives actually admitted that they are biased in the liberal sense. Now, can you imagine? That's just hard to believe that TV has been presented to us as liberal bias. That someone could actually admit that is amazing. I think the whole world knew it. It was no one was just saying it. 
Also, Dr. Susan Johnson Cook. She's a Baptist preacher. She's from New York. And she has been sworn in to be the new religion ambassador across the globe. I saw Hillary talking to her, and she was so excited about bringing this lady in. She also warned that there'd be many trouble spots across the world. Is that not true, having to do with religion? But this woman says that she believes in equality for all religions and that she will worship with all religions across the world. And after she's done that, she will get back to Hillary Clinton and to President Obama and give her a report, give them a report of what she has found. Yes. <laughs> but she's coming from America, another new position. Dr. Bernice King, she's the niece of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. I don't know if any of you have seen her on TV. She's a very powerful woman. She's been an elder in a church with Eddie Long down in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't know if any of you have heard about any of the situations going on with him. He's been accused by four young men. I guess they're older now, but when they were youths, that there were uh, improper sexual advances. Bishop Long denies accusation and says that he's innocent of these allegations, but he also settled out of court in this past week to have this to go no further as far as the situation. It's not going to court. He has a huge church. The church has seen a decline in attendance and in tithing, and I'm not just giving you the story because of, of Eddie Long. Churches across our country are having situations, whether it's financial issues that are questionable or immorality, and people are suffering in the churches. People are being so deceived because they're following the man and not God. Our eyes are on man so many times. And this is the reason I'm giving you this story. This was in the news. Not that I'm just coming down on him alone. I'm using this as an example because it's current. But when you're in a church, especially a large church, and something happens where the pastor has to step down or there are questions even if he doesn't, issues that haven't been addressed and resolved, the congregation, the people really suffer, and it is painful. I was on staff in a situation where something happened that was nothing compared to this situation. I mean, it was so minute, but the pastor decided to step down. It was one of the toughest things I've ever been through in my life with brokenhearted people and pain and anger and things that, that we're seeing in our churches. We've got to learn how to help people in these situations. People have to know that they have to go to the Word of God, that we have to pray to get through these things. The church needs to bring restoration to people. And we have to address the issues at hand. As I said, I used his issue just because it's something current, not that I, was, I really wanted to just stick with. But I've seen this happen over and over. How many times in the newspaper over the years, no matter who it's been in the last 20, 30, 40 years, have we seen people who have fallen and what has happened to their congregations, to the people? So these were just some things I wanted to mention that needs to take place in churches that are broken and hurting. Since we're talking about church things, I want to tell you that the courts rule against churches meeting in public school facilities in New York. And there are 60 congregations right now meeting in schools there, and they're telling them that that's not going to be a possibility any longer. This was in New York. It didn't say if it was New York City or New York State. It just stated New York. So that's a lot if it's just New York City, huh, 60. Something a little lighter, still having to do with God, believe it or not. Red Banks Valley High School in New Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. That's around Philly somewhere. It has a school Bible group. They have meetings weekly there. Two-thirds of the kids attend from a high school, voluntarily attend. They do skits, games, videos. They present a loving message. The leadership is done only by the students. And the students say being a Christian is fun. Can you imagine in this day and age with kids, teenage kids? <laughs> we hear all this negativity about teenagers and school and things. And they have found out they have the freedom to talk about God in school and to do these things. And they're loving it and it's growing. 
Wouldn't this be a wonderful thing to see in every city to have at least one public school where the kids could really get to have the freedom to know Jesus and to love him? Boy, wouldn't our world change. Another thing about the Bible. The Bible, your cell phone is now your Bible. Social media. I don't know if many of you know about this because most of us are, are older in this room and, you know, our kids would know, our grandkids would know this. If you go to the, to the app store on iTunes, you can download 50 versions of the Bible in three languages, English, Spanish, and Norwegian. And it's free. And when I'm in meetings now with people, young people in their 20s, their early 30s, every time we're doing something, having to bring a verse out, or they pull out their iPhones. I see them doing this, four or five. If there are 10 of us in a meeting, five of them are doing that. And I'm thinking, what are they doing with their iPhones when we're supposed to, they're looking up on the, you know, they're using that as their Bible. They're going to have eight new languages added this year. 80,000 people downloaded in the first three days. Can you imagine? They were hoping to have 80,000 people in a year, three days. Right now they have 16 million downloads of the Bible free. Is that impressive? Dave, that's something that, this is your area of expertise. Isn't that exciting? Isn't it? A new, it's the new thing, the new way. For those of us that like the pages of our Bible and still read the newspaper instead of being online, this, you know, this is hard to understand. Okay, Oprah, 25 years, she says goodbye. This is probably the biggest thing that's happened to the world. Do you know that she's one of the most influential people in the whole world, not just our country, but the whole world? Not only that, she's one of the richest, too. She's a billionaire. She's had a lot to say, and people have listened to a lot of things that she has said. And some of the things were very good, you know, and some of the people and situations she's brought up. I don't watch it. My daughter tapes it faithfully every day and watches it at night. She wants to be viewed as someone who translates and understands herself as a Christian woman, but reflects a modern attitude about religion and religious institutions. Oprah promoted herself as a New Age spiritualist. She had... And I can't remember the program where you could go online and there were thousands doing it. I'm so sorry I don't have that information, but I can remember this Tolly or something, this guy that was doing it who was a New Age guy. Critics say she's not promoting the God of the Bible, but was indoctrinating her audience into a New Age spiritualism. Oprah reflects the common American practice of choosing whatever beliefs seem most attractive says Josh McDowell. So we wonder, will, will Oprah someday be judged before God as a heretic for the things that she's done? She's influenced a lot of people into new age. But we say, God bless Oprah, she'll still be around doing her thing. But isn't that amazing? 25 years and it was like the highlight thing in the world to hear. Also, this is something I don't know if Tom's aware of, but you'll be interested in. Physician accused of pushing religion will fight reprimand from General Medical Council. There was a general practitioner in with an entire group of, Christ whoa, of Christian men that were doctors, and he was sharing his faith with a patient. And this patient, patient had no objection to the things he was saying. And he said he, having faith in Jesus helped him and could also help patients. So he wanted to know that, that um, he was in a unique position to reach out to those in the community and to the area. And good doctors do not treat their patients solely as uh, biological or biochemical machines, he says. He said you must practice whole person medicine that is not concerned solely with your physical needs but also addresses social, psychological, behavior, and spiritual matters, matters that may be contributing to a person's illness. Wouldn't you love to have him for a doctor? Where he's looking at your whole life and wanting to talk to you and find out what's causing the stress and the pain and things in your life. Now I know Tom has been called on the carpet by the people he's worked for. It's never gone into the medical board for talking about Jesus. Someone complained one time about, he had Jesus written, going a scroll across his thing, and 
across his computer screen and a person was in his office being treated and they complained about that. And then I had another patient, I had another patient in the next booth overheard me talk. Somebody asked me, would you pray for me? I said, sure. And then the patient in the next booth complained about it. Praise God for the Holy Spirit conviction. Yeah, but they went to the clinic, to the head people of the clinic, telling, complaining about him. He, I know, he got a verbal warning, but it didn't go to the medical profession. So I knew you'd be interested in that one. Christians are worried about Egypt being hijacked by Islam. Didn't we say that at the beginning when there would be the change? Is that what's going to come in? You know, the brotherhood? And did you know that there are 20,000 Jews living in Israel that embrace Christ? That's exciting to know that they're living there and that they're embracing Jesus Christ as Lord. Then I want to tell you about China has a shortage of women. I mean, this is really very, very severe because years ago they said you could have one child. The government stated you could have one child. And if they knew it was female, they aborted that child until they could just have a male child. Now they have all these ma young men of age to marriage. There are no women for them. They are going online to organizations that are online trying to find women from other countries to be brought in. But one of their concerns is that now they're having trafficking of bringing in women from other countries. They're just, you know, we're concerned about young girls being picked up off the streets and taken, and they're bringing them into China now. And there's definitely a gender imbalance there for one. Men are looking for soulmates on online systems. That right now there are 122 boys being born to every 100 girls. And they said that it, by 2020, there'll be 40,000 men that will be available that will have no spouses. But at the same time, our top U.S. military commanders expressed deep concern over Chinese military buildup. Has, has this not been what Tom's been telling us about the kings of the East will bring their 200 million army, the male army, over to attack Israel? And they're seeing this. They're concerned about it now. And this situation tells you why they could have so many men that could be in an army. Our uh, Senate extended the Patriot Act four more years where they're going to be able to search records and conduct uh, roving wiretaps in pursuit of terrorists. But that also involves all of us also. They have that ability to do that. This was very interesting to me. Tom brought this article home on um, Ahmadinejad that the parliament over there just this past Wednesday said he acted illegally by declaring himself a caretaker uh, of oil minister. He fired the one that was there, took over the position himself to be in charge of all the oil in Iran. And the parliament saying this is an illegal thing that he has done and that they're increasing, increasing pressure on him to quit the post. But since this article came out, he actually has given the position to someone else and is pulling back. But we haven't seen much. Tom mentioned this two weeks ago. We haven't seen much of him on TV the way he was before. And so the parliament over there is not pleased with him. There is conflict. He was, he was uh, obviously in violation of their law when he did this. Top UN officials say that the US could veto, our one veto would block the vote on Palestinian statehood. If we were the only country that blocked it and vetoed Palestine coming on board and splitting Jerusalem and all the things that we want to do, that it could be stopped. When Netanyahu was here and talked to our Congress and, and to our senators, he was very well received. If we could just go to all of them and ask them to make a difference to change the president's mind on what's happening it would make a difference. Last weekend, there was a G8 summit, G8 summit held in France. Eight world leaders, it was the United States, Canada, Germany, Italy, uh, Britain, Japan, France. They came together to discuss issues. While we were having Memorial Day weekend relaxing, they were doing all the stuff that I'm going to tell you about. They were dealing with issues as ongoing Arab issues. 
the U.S. committed $20 billion towards enhancing democratic transformation. That's what they committed to, President, over there. Also, a package of $40 billion for Northern Africa, supposedly to help set up stable governments in the place of deposed dictators. So there's $60 billion right there from these eight countries. Do you think it's going to make a difference? Will it produce stability or healthy pro-Western governments for human rights? It's not going to make a difference, is it? It'll be going into a regime that's just as corrupt as the ones they've replaced. They dealt with Libya. The eight leaders demanded that Gaddafi cease using force against Libyan civilians and promised that Gaddafi could, could leave and be unharmed. They dealt with Syria, and they said that Assad was to stop using force and intimidation against the Syrian people. Do you think their voice and their opinions have a big effect on the treatment of the people over there? They are more concerned in Syria about Iran and Turkey's opinions than they are of the West. They're more concerned what they want and what they want to do versus our countries. They talked about Russia. The President Obama over there did not resolve the missile defense system issue. Big things, nuclear safety, they talked about. The biggest lesson that was learned from Japan was the importance of nuclear safety. Or we all can see that, can't we? Germany's chancellor said that she was going to exit nuclear power over there, so she's going to have to have a whole new way of power and electricity and whatever they're going to use in Germany. And this could stunt the growth of Europe's largest economy. They talked about defense issues, and Canada came to Israel's defense at this meeting. They are the one backing them, not the United States. Wasn't that wonderful that the president of Canada, is the prime minister, what do they call Canada? Prime minister of Canada, that he came to the defense of Israel. Praise God. No. The quote from the uh, Canadian Prime Minister, and this was uh, relayed by a Native American woman during the Aurora event at Salem, the State House Steps in Salem, was that as long as Israel has breath, Canada will stand beside her. That was what the Prime Minister of Canada said about uh, that country's support of Israel. And so we need to prayerfully support Canada because they're standing up and being counted. And praise God for that because somebody in this age needs to. And now I'm praying that the United States will but uh, Canada is. And so um, I just pray that God will bless the country for that. Amen. Amen. We really don't believe that pushing the borders back for Israel before 67 is going to really make a difference, that they would do such a thing. They would be foolish. Or that Hamas would accept Israel's right to exist. None of those things are really going to happen. That's what they think will happen if we give them what they want. Also, this G8 dealt with the reeling global economy. The EU recognized that it has to get a hold of its sovereign debt problems. They said Greece cannot be allowed to default. It just isn't something that they're going to be able to permit to have happen without it just turning everything upside down. Will Europe fix its debt problems and spur the economies of the world towards prosperity? Probably not. They talked about climate change also while they were with this G8. Well, one of the things they said, the one definite accomplishment of the summit seems to be that Russia will be buying some very expensive warplanes, warships from France. That was one thing they were sure was going to happen. The E. coli outbreak in Germany, have you seen where 19 people have died and like almost 1,800 people have come down with this E. coli? It's supposed to be a very rare strain, one they've not seen before, that's very dangerous. It, atta it attacks the kidneys, and they're not sure of the source. And a little levity. I'm coming to the end. I know it's been a long time. Tom told me in the car the other day he didn't have a lot of material, so take a lot of time. But, but then he took a lot of time himself. <laughs> GOP, our presidential campaign for the GOP. Governor Mitt Romney from Massachusetts sits in. Donald Trump is out. Sarah Palin, where is she? Is she in or is she out? 
Word to see, she's traveling the country though. And last, I want to talk to you about something a little easier, a little lighter, movies. While we were with our grandchildren, we took them to see Kung Fu uh, Panda 2. It was a very good movie. It was fun. It, de it deals with pro-family issues, but especially adoption. If you have someone in your family or a child or, you know, a grandchild where there is adoption issues, this is a good movie for them to go see because they deal with that and being loved and accepted. And the next day we went to see Rio. The weather was so bad there was nothing to do but to go to movies because it was raining and overcast and everything. It was a fun, upbeat movie with a good message too. The message in that was you can do it. So it's fun for kids to see that. So new movie coming out today, The Lion of Judah, animated for children. I looked, it's not here. I looked in our papers to see what was out. But in this movie, I'm trying to think. Sandy Patty plays one of the characters and Ernest Borgnine. And if, if you have a chance to see it, you know, back the people that are putting money out for the children's things and, and the Christian. Even as adults, we need to see that. That's where we spend our money, you know. X-Man is out also, but it is not a family movie. It is not considered pro-family from the review that I saw. And I'm glad to tell you that I can turn this over now. <laughs> I'm sorry it was so long. <laughs> Thank you, but you had some very good stuff. I'm sorry I ran late. We have some information and announcements from Pastor Dave regarding upcoming activities, events, and what's transpiring in Ephesians Visions and Ministry. We do appreciate any and all offerings and um, gifts that you may would like to send us. We have some requests for items that we need. And uh, if you have an RV or a camper, that would help us a great deal. So, Dave. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to I'll try to roll through this as quickly as possible. Um, we've got a lot going on right now. Um, God's really put on, on our hearts to, to reach the world for Jesus Christ. And one of the things that we are doing is um, we were approached this late last week asking us to be involved in uh, putting on audio streams with foreign languages. Uh, and we have launched our first one. Let me pull it up here. It's uh, online as of this afternoon. It's Japanese, and uh, it's well, that's the New Testament in Japanese. Uh, Alex, who is working with uh, um, Kingdom Investments, uh, who's attending in our building, his wife uh, is Japanese. She lived in Japan until she was 19, and she's going to help us do some production. Uh, we've been approached at producing and providing the infrastructure for um, the Word of God and encouraging uh, encouraging news to be put online in several languages, and Japanese is the first one. Uh, and we feel strongly that we're supposed to do that. So uh, we ask for your support. Um, Kingdom Investments is the ministry that's paying for that. Uh, we're providing the infrastructure here and the technical support for that. Um, Islam and Freemasonry. We have a special guest that's going to be coming here Sunday, June 12th at EVM in this very room. His name is uh, Bill Suddeth. He is currently going and visiting 50 states and they're conducting training and prayer to break off the hold of Islam and Freemasonry in the United States. They have been to, I think they have, uh, their goal is to be to 50 states by October 5th, and then they're going to visit Washington, D.C. Sixteen states remain, and one of those states is Oregon. And uh, they will be visiting here June 12th. It's going to be 1 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, if you plan on attending, please RSVP. Uh, it will be online, streamed live with audio and video, so the people who can't come 
um, will be watching it. We have a church in Portland that will be watching it online, and then they're going to be calling in afterwards uh, at 5 o'clock during the end of the session with questions for Bill. So this might be the Oregon event for, um, for Bill Suddeth to go around and, and break off Freemasonry and uh, Islam and teach us about it. Now, a little bit about Bill Suddeth. Bill uh, is with Righteous Acts Ministries, and it was birthed out of the revival that occurred in Brownsville. Uh, they've served as members of the pastoral care staff and faculty at the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry in Pensacola, Florida. He has a, a lot of experience in, in Holy Spirit, in um, deliverance, discipleship, teaching, preaching, and praying for healing. So that will be June 12th here at EVM. No charge, but we will take a free will offering. So we invest and in, ask you to please consider watching or um, praying for that. 9-11 uh, Remembered event is going to be coming up on Sunday, 9-11. We're asking for community partners to partner with us on that. Uh, we are going to be having an outreach in downtown Bend with the Freedom Team. They're the team that uh, conducts feats of strength, uh, fold up frying pans, tear phone books, and blow up hot water bottles till they explode. And it's a very entertaining show. But also interlaced in that is the message of the gospel in a very relatable fashion. Uh, this team is going to be going with us to New Zealand uh, in November 1st, 2011. Uh, God's, uh, this uh, is Saturday, June 25th at 3 p.m. Thanks for asking. I didn't mention that. Uh, free admission. It's going to be a block south of McMinimums right next to Troy Field. So we are going to be that day before the event. We're going to be asking volunteers to go with us downtown to tell people in the area that this is going to be happening and inviting them to come on and, and see the show. And we'll be talking about the entertainment aspects of it and then get them there and, and have them hear the message of the gospel. Um, we believe it's we're in, speaking of knowing the seasons, we believe that we are in the end times. I am not going to predict a day. But what I, it just, there's something that's burning inside of me to tell as many people as possible as quickly as we can. Uh, that's part of why we want to get more into foreign languages and uh, use the internet as extensively as we do. Um, we have started the Christian News Network called TJN the Jesus Network. Uh, we are looking for an RV or a pole trailer camper. Uh, we are going to be going to use that for a remote broadcast unit and a staging unit for events that we go to. In mid-July, we're going to be covering the um, Roar Camp Meetings, uh, celebrating the Celilo Fall Camp Meetings. That's where the Holy Spirit fell on, uh, in 1905, I believe is when it was, fell on the Native Americans and some amazing things happened uh, in revival in the Nez Perce tribe. They're called the Celilo Falls Camp Meetings, and they're going to be celebrating that and they're going to be reenacting that, and we're going to be there reporting it. One of the challenges that you have whenever you go and do a, a, a live broadcast like that is the equipment we drag along. If the weather is inclement, uh, it's hard to throw that in the back of your car and continue a broadcast, where an RV is something that we're really going to be needing as we take it to the next level, which is going and broadcasting live events from around the state. Our first lawn location broadcast was in the State House Steps in Salem. It was four and a half hours long. It started to rain. And we were trying to do it under a plastic kitchen um, tablecloth and uh, raincoats. And we didn't lose any equipment, but it was very, very difficult to, to continue the broadcast. So if anybody is watching, if anybody knows of, of an RV or a pull trailer for a camper, um, we definitely are getting to the point where we're going to need one because of what we're involved in doing and what we believe God is taking us to do. Um, what else? 24-hour prayer going on here. We just want to tell people about Jesus. There's just a real need right now um, to do that. We also need to example as Christians that we're not living in fear. One of the things that I constantly see out there is fear among non-Christians. 
They're looking to us as Christians to see if we really believe what we've been speaking about. I interviewed a Christian today who is uh, the um, mayor pro tem of Bend. Her name is Jody Barham. She was involved with the pink fire truck campaign at 3rd and Franklin. And if they raise $5,000 for cancer research, she's going to shave her head. We did an interview with her, which will be on YouTube tonight, where she talks about why she's doing it and her faith in Jesus Christ and how she wants to use this as a forum to, to show people the gospel through her life and through her actions. So we need to pray for politicians who are believers. Bruce Hanna, who's the co-chair of the Oregon House, is another very strong believer. Uh, so what we try to do in our journeys is find these people and then keep them in prayer and cover them in prayer as they're making decisions affecting the government uh, on all levels of government and in all nations. One of the things I do want to mention is we did have a conversation with the head of the healing rooms in Japan uh, about what her hunger is for that nation to see a revival. One of the things she said kind of sticks with me. She says that, that we as American Christians need not to go to Japan with preconceived notions of what we think revival should look like in that culture, that we should work with them and work through the culture and pray with them and agree with them and instead of just going there and saying well this is how we do it in America to work through them and with them and and embrace their vision of what they want to see revival looking like in their particular culture uh, and we're praying with them as prayer partners uh, through the network and um, through now the streaming uh, to, to see God really do some amazing things in Japan they've had some major problems as you well know with the tsunami and the earthquake but God's doing some amazing things um, we'll have news reports on that but I don't have time yet to go into all that so one thing we need right now is an RV uh, and as time goes on we're really going to need it so we're we're renewing the call for one and uh, as you continue to financially support the ministry to allow us to do this these things uh, that's most appreciated and I think that should do it Thank you for coming. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Uh, we will not be on next Friday due to uh, uh, Internet reasons, but we will resume in two weeks on the Internet uh, with America in Prophecy to let you know where America is going, where it's been, and what the Bible says about prophecy. So, Father, I just thank you tonight for all that your word presented, Lord, that your word is one, the one true Lord, word that we follow. I thank you, Lord, for your blessings on Ephesians Visions Ministry, for your blessings on the people at home that are watching this around the world, for the blessings on the people here and those that are among our body that couldn't be here tonight, Lord. Father, I ask you to be with us, watch over us, protect us. And let your hand be upon us. Let us not be afraid because you stand strong supporting us. And we give you all the praise and the glory and honor. And everybody says amen. amen. Good night, everybody. See you in two weeks.